Okay, so shall we shall we start? So can anyone can everyone hear me? Yes, I Hello? can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, so uh, thank you, guys, for joining the second season of IEEE Comsoc SPS ISAC webinar series. So we have uh, we have finished our first season this um, August. And we're back for, uh, at this November, and this will be a monthly two-in-one seminar. So every month we will invite two speakers working in the area of integrated sensing and communication. And today we are very uh, honored and fortunate to have Professor Jan Andrew Zhang and Yiming Daniel Zhang um, as our speakers, okay? So this uh, webinar series uh, is co-organized by ISAC ETI, ISAC TWG and OTFSC. So before beginning the uh, um, seminar, I would like to uh, call for papers. These are some, these are some of the uh, future uh, workshops and uh, symposium on uh, ISAC re re related uh, um, areas. And this is the second actually symposium on joint communications and sensing uh, with a firm deadline of no November 26th of this year, and we're also organizing a, a workshop on ISAC, on IEEE WCNC and IEEE ICC of the next year. And uh, okay, so our first speaker will be Professor Andrew Zhang. So Andrew Zhang is an associate professor at the School of Electrical and Data Engineering and the director of the Radio Sense and Pattern Anal Analysis Laboratory, University of Technology, Sydney. And he received a bachelor degree from Xi'an Jiao Tong University, China, a master degree from Nanjing University of Post and Telecommunications, China, and a PhD degree from the uh, Australian National University. Okay, so Professor Zhang is uh, passionate about research innovation. He's a world renowned researcher in wireless communications and sensing. Professor Zhang has published more than 210 papers in leading international journals and conference proceedings and hold six patents. He has won five best paper awards, including best paper award in ICC 2030. And he's a recipient of CISRO Top Award, CISRO Chairman's Medal, and Australian Engineer Innovation Award in 2012. Uh, he's serving as an editor of HVATCOM. Professor John is one of the leading researchers on joint communication and radio radar sensing, JCAS, uh, also known as ISAP, and the perceptive mobile networks with the publication of 16 papers in top journals on this area. So Professor Zhang initiated the concept of perceptive mobile network, which is uh, the topic of today's talk by defining system framework and demonstrating its feasibility in a set of papers back to 2017. So um, he has been leading four industrial projects of applying JCAS technologies in cellular, Wi-Fi, and UAV communication networks. Okay, so our second speaker will be Professor Yiming Daniel Zhang, and I will introduce um, Professor Zhang in the, next, uh, in the next talk. So before we begin in the uh, 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 talk, I would like to remind you about our Q&A rules. So during the uh, seminar, audiences will be muted during the seminar and uh, oh, please do not an annotate on your screen. So please remember this, do not annotate on your screen because everyone can see it. So please type your questions and send them to the host and co-host and we will collect questions from both audiences from Zoom and offsite lab broadcasting. And during the Q&A, we will choose three to five questions to ask a speaker and uh, you will be named and encouraged to ask questions by yourself. Okay, so, so much for the introduction and please thanks and enjoy. Okay, so uh, I'll hand over to uh, Andrew. So Andrew, please go ahead. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Professor Liu. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, can you see that? Yeah, 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 we can. All right, excellent. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm honored and uh, 
pleased to uh, have the opportunity to share with you some of our research experience on ISAC technologies, particular uh, on applying ISAC technology to mobile networks. My talk uh, is mainly uh, based on the survey paper that was recently accepted. And uh, for more mathematical formulations, you can also refer to our overview paper. I will mainly discuss our own work uh, because uh, due to the limited time and uh, we are only briefly review the works by other researchers. So I roughly follow the structure for our survey paper. Uh, as you know, there are three types of for uh, joint uh, communication and the sensing systems. Uh, since, uh, since we mainly use the terminology for JCAS in the past, instead of ISAC, so I will still use uh, uh, JCAS in this talk. Uh, we know there are three types of for JCAS systems, uh, radar centric, communication centric, and uh, joint design without using underlying system. PMM is uh, one type of uh, communication centric uh, design. It uh, integrates uh, JCAS in the mobile networks. So in this talk, we will first have a look at the framework for PMN and then discuss how to evolve the communication only mobile network to PMM with the integrated communication and sensing capabilities. And we will also have a look at um, uh, several key research problems and uh, critical technologies, mainly on waveform optimization sensing parameter estimation and the resolution of sensing ambiguity due to the clock uh, asynchronism between transmitter and receivers. So these three areas are also the areas that we have started most so far. PMM, um, so from the concept uh, or the name, it uh, stands for perceptive mobile network, right? So we try to introduce uh, perceptive perceptivity capability to the communication only network. Uh, then we can expect a ubiquitous uh, sensing network on top of for the communication. In general, we can achieve the sensing uh, without uh, compromising the communication performance and uh, without uh, requiring significant uh, new investment. So this, uh, in terms of the, both the potentials and the cost, uh, uh, this uh, network is very attractive. We can realize uh, uh, sensing based on multiple topologies for communication networks. For example, we can realize it based on a standalone base station. We can also realize it based on the uh, what we call the CRAN cloud radio access network. We, we know there are uplink and downlink communications in the uh, mobile network. Accordingly, we can define uplink sensing and a downlink sensing. And for downlink sensing, we can further divide it into downlink passive sensing and a downlink uplink, uh, downlink active sensing and a downlink passive sensing. So for downlink passive sensing, we mean we mean the sensing done using the signal from another base station. So for example, if we refer to the CRAN structure, then we use the signal received at uh, the remote radio unit three uh, from the signal transmitted from remote radio unit two, right? And uh, for active sensing, we mean the, sig the sensing signal is coming from the same transmitter. So uh, the passive and the active sensing, they are named in a way similar to the passive and active sensing in radar. And um, uh, for both the standalone base station and the CRAN structure, we can achieve the three types of sensings. And uh, these uh, integrations actually can see uh, different uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages. In particular, for downlink sensing, we have the major problem of achieving for duplex because uh, particularly in the downlink active sensing, the transmitter and uh, receiver for sensing, they are co-located, right? So the, the 
reflected uh, sensing signal is uh, overlapped with the transmitter signal in time. So basically this requires full duplex uh, capability. And then for downlink, uh, sense, downlink passive sensing, the full duplex requirement is not essential. We can relax this requirement by using spatial separated transmitter and receiver, particularly for into the serial structure. And for uplink sensing, the main issue is um, the clock asynchronism between the transmitter and the receiver, because uh, in general, the mobile uh, units and the base station, they, they, are, they, are use, uh, they use separate uh, local oscillators. So their clocks have some offset in terms of both the timing and the frequency, uh, carrier frequency. We will discuss the details uh, uh, later. Uh, have had a look at the signal, uh, the system structure. We now have a look at um, what kind of signals can be used for sensing. And to summarize, uh, basically all the signals, all the communication signals can be used, but uh, different uh, properties of the signal can lead to different uh, sensing performance. For example, if we have regular signals in the time domain, then we can expect good sensing performance and a lot of sensing algorithms can be applied, uh, in particular for the estimation of the Doppler frequency. And uh, if the signal is regular in frequency domain, then we can expect a good uh, delay estimation. And uh, if the signal's value is known, then excellent, we can, uh, directly use a signal for sensing or we can remove it, right? And uh, coloration and orthogonality, this property is also very important um, because uh, ideally for sensing, we require uh, specially orthogonal signals. Uh, according to the theorem of uh, MIMO radar, orthogonality can lead to uh, extension of a virtual array um, with a larger aperture. So orthogonality is a desired feature for signal, for sensing signals in particular. And we also expect a flexibility in the signal structure and the pre-coding so that uh, we can optimize the signal by considering both the, the uh, communication and the radar performance. So we have uh, quickly discussed the properties that are desired for sensing. And then we can refer to the 5G NR signals, see what kind of signals are uh, good uh, for sensing. So this figure shows the structure for NR uh, new radio, 5G new radio signal. Basically we have uh, the frame uh, consisted of uh, all of them symbols, right? Each, uh, each frame consists of uh, several subframe, and one subframe consists of uh, 14 OFDIM symbols. And these, uh, these uh, resource uh, block, uh, blocks, they are allocated to different uh, types of signals. Within these signals, um, their features, their properties are quite different. And we can actually divide these signals into three major classes. One class is called, we call it uh, reference signals. These signals are mainly used for channel estimation. And uh, they have uh, good properties such as uh, they are orthogonal, they are known, and uh, they are generally regular. They have regular comb structure in the frequency domain. So these are all good properties in terms of sensing, but they are generally irregular and uh, could have varying length in the time domain. This is not good for, um, for Doppler frequency estimation. And uh, their they presence is generally not um, uh, free, very frequent. Uh, they are users dependent. So their volume, the volume of the signal is not very large. Another class uh, is a synchronization signal. Uh, this type of signal, they have the good properties uh, for orthogonality. They are known and uh, they are uh, short, but they are regular in the time domain. So we can expect where they will uh, appear. Right? For, the, for the reference signals, we cannot expect where, when they can come. They are irregular in the time domain. So the 
synchronization, synchronization signal, they can also be used for sensing, but, um, uh, but they have the disadvantage for uh, small volume. They, they are sparsely distributed in the frequency domain. So that means we probably can only get a small signal to noise ratio when we use the synchronization signal for, for sensing. And the third type is data payload. Data payload, um, um, it's the main signal in each uh, packet, right? But um, they are unknown and uh, uh, unknown in the sense of downlink, uh, in the sense of uplink sensing. If it's downlink sensing, it can also be known because the transmitter receiver, they are co either co-located co or they are connected. Right? Um, one, one disadvantage of such a signal is they are stati statistically independent. Uh, this can lead to low correlation, but uh, they are not orthogonal at a particular time. So this is something we, uh, we needed to be care careful when we use the data payload uh, for uh, sensing. If the signal is uh, unknown in uplink sensing, demodulating the signal will also introduce some errors. So these are, this is another uh, disadvantage, but uh, they have large volumes. So eventually we think a data payload would be a very good option for sensing usage. The key, key issue is how to resolve the disadvantages that we just mentioned. All right, um, let's have a look at the channel models that can be used to describe the sensing. Uh, we have the time domain and the frequency domain channel models here. We can see that uh, they are quite similar to the, the ones used in uh, millimeter wave research recently, because they are based uh, on the representation for uh, sensing parameters. Right? Here we have, uh, we have uh, path delay, we have Doppler shift, uh, AOA, AOD, and the uh, amplitude. So these uh, five, variables, we call them sensing parameters. In terms of uh, the, uh, here, we, we, we say sensing is uh, with respect to the localization and uh, speed estimation, estimation uh, application. Some sensings, they don't really need uh, these uh, sensing parameters. For example, in the typical Wi-Fi sensings being studied so far, they don't really care too much about uh, this uh, uh, location and speed related sensing parameters they are more interested in applying the signals directly. So our main focus in this, in this talk is on the sensing parameter estimation. Uh, this, these uh, two channel models, as we discussed, they are quite similar to the existing ones in millimeter wave communication in particular, but uh, there are two, uh, there are one major difference here. So the, this is a timing offset term and this is a, a frequency offset term. So these two terms for communication, they are not a major concern because uh, frequency, carrier frequency offset, they can be estimated uh, quite accurately. And um, uh, timing offset, they can be absorbed uh, into channel estimation, right? They don't need to be separated with the path delay. They can be treated as a single parameter and uh, absorbed in channel estimation. But of a sensing, we have to deal with uh, these two uh, carefully, these two variables carefully, because uh, uh, sensing our timing offset will cause uh, ranging ambiguity. And uh, frequency offset and the timing offset, uh, they are also time variable. They are time varying because of the uh, instability of the local uh, oscillator. So they changes with time. In this uh, case, they will introduce a random phase shift to um, to off dim symbols over some uh, interval, over some long time interval.
Sorry, Andrew. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but uh, it seems that uh, we cannot hear your voice. So can you um can you see what, what happened? And can you hear now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now okay, sorry. I, I accidentally um, pushed the button. Okay, okay. On the controller. Please. Sorry. Yeah. Um yeah, so this uh, this channel model can represent um, uh, most of the sensing scenarios that we have discussed. And this is a good one if you want to use uh, use it in your research. But just um, just uh, note that uh, we actually uh, ignored the phase shift caused uh, by uh, phase shift uh, due uh, within an orthodim block due to the Doppler frequency. So that means uh, we uh, this model can only be used in slow time varying channels. And for faster time varying, we can we will discuss a little bit later. There are potentially many applications, um, uh, in particular in the smart transportation and uh, smart city. Wi-Fi sensing has been widely used for smart home, although um, PMN can also be used, but uh, maybe Wi-Fi will still be a more popular option. But uh, in larger areas, for example, in smart city, smart transportation, and also environmental sensing, we can see more uh, popular, we will see more popular applications of PMN in the near future. All right, uh, next let's have a look at uh, how we may evolve the current communication only uh, net mobile network to the one with uh, integrated sensing capability. We first have a look at the hardware, uh, the transceiver itself. This figure shows uh, the main modules of a transceiver based on MIMO OFDM. The purple blocks uh, represent the, those that uh, can be fully shared by communication and sensing. The blue ones are for communication only and the black one for sensing only. And the red one is for the module that, that uh, do cooperation between communication and the sensing. So as we can see, a majority of the modules can be shared by communication and the sensing. That's why it's very attractive to integrate uh, these two systems in terms of the hardware itself. And um, Network-wide, uh, uh, there are some issues we need to take care of. We first uh, have a look at uh, the major difference between radar and comms. So for radar, we can see there are two major types of radar systems. One is a continuous, one is pulsed. For con continuous wave radar, they can do four duplex operation, but this is achieved by using a special transceiver architecture. Essentially, they use uh, the transmitter signal as the uh, input to the local oscillator so that uh, they can apply a band pass filter to completely remove the uh, leakage signal directly from the transmitter because the bandwidth of the output signal here is related to the, the reflect uh, distance. The shorter the distance, the smaller the bandwidth or the low frequency of the signal. So using band pass filter, we can achieve uh, uh, for duplex transmission in continuous wave radar. And the pulse radar, they use, uh, uh, they essentially, they are half a duplex system because they separate the transmission and the receiving in time. But we cannot really uh, use this kind of uh, techniques in communication systems. We know we, in communication system, transmitter receiver, they are typically separated. They don't have the locked clock in the two nodes. And um, if they use uh, uh, downlink sensing, in particular downlink active sensing, then transmit receiver, they are co-located. Uh, they have the uh, four duplex uh, issue. Although four duplex communication has been studied, but it's still a long way to go for practical applications. So the, 
the modification, the system modification required uh, are mainly um, needed, mainly used to deal with uh, the two issues we just mentioned, the four duplex requirement and the clock asynchronism. We can have um, uh, both near-term and long-term solutions. Near-term solution, they are suboptimal. Long-term uh, long -term solution would be the four duplex one. The short-term or near-term solutions, um, we can have a couple of options. For example, we can use a dedicated transmitter or, or we use a dedicated receiver. So in this case, we can uh, avoid the four duplex requirement. And if we use uh, such a transmitter receivers in the Syrian architecture, their clocks are also locked. So we don't have the clock uh, asynchronism problem as well. Um, these are the potential suboptimal sub near-term solutions. Yeah, we, we think there are two uh, near-term solutions that are particular attractive. One option is for uplink sensing. Uh, we, we don't really need to, uh, we, we don't really need to have a clock uh, uh, locked between the two between the transmitter and receiver, we can use signal processing to resolve the this uh, clock uh, asynchronism issue. We will discuss more details uh, shortly. And another option is using one specially widely separated receiver antennas for sensing. So we still have the normal transmitter and a normal communication node. We only needed to add one additional. Uh, Antenna. This is separated, especially water separated from the existing antennas. Um, since we only require one one addition one additional antenna, so the cost will be quite low, and uh, we can use uh, multiple transmitter, one one dedicated uh, antenna for receiver to achieve the sensing function. Because uh, in the active sensing, active downlink sensing case, the AOD can be used uh, uh, as uh, AOA to locate uh, the object. And uh, other estimations uh, we can achieve uh, similar performance, only some degradation in terms of the SNR. Uh, so this would be a attractive option for downlink active sensing. All right, uh, next uh, let's have a look at uh, some uh, key research problems and the critical technologies. Because this is a relatively new area, so there are many research opportunities. We have reviewed uh, many of these uh, research opportunities in the survey paper. And uh, due to the time limit, we can over only cover three here. So we will mainly uh, discuss uh, joint wave from design, uh, parameter, uh, sending parameter estimation, and uh, the resolution of the, uh, the timing ambiguity. Joint waveform optimization, this is probably the topic that has been, that has been mostly studied in JCAS so far. We, we have seen many optimization ideas. For example, we can optimize the preamble uh, by designing the training sequence we can also optimize the data payload together with the preamble by considering their, for example, power or location and uh, the special precoder design. We can also optimize the length of the packets or the interval between the packets so that we can achieve uh, uh, excellent or improved uh, Doppler shift estimation. And uh, we can also achieve in other domains so we will mainly uh, have a look at uh, the op optimization techniques uh, in the special domain today. Before we are able to do the joint waveform design, we need to understand the performance metrics for radar and communications. So for radar, we mainly care about, uh, for example, the detection probability. And in terms of the sensing parameter estimation, we're probably mainly interested in the grammar raw low bond. Um, we, we also see some work on optimizing the mutual information and uh, in radar community, the ambiguity function is also an important one. 
for communications, we care about uh, bit error rate, uh, signal to noise ratio, and uh, capacity and rate, etc. There are uh, in our opinion, there are typically two types of uh, optimization approaches when we talk about a special domain optimization. So one is that we use a single precoder, special precoder. Right? We can uh, formulate uh, an objective function, lambda p, and uh, subject to some constraints. Another way is uh, what we call the de decomposed approach. So here, P is decomposed into some submetrics. Um, for example, we can define, predefine some metrics, some submetrics for communication and the sensing respectively. And then we um, try to optimize the way of combining them to get the P. Right. Uh, one example is, okay, P is equal to a linear combination of PC and the PS. Then we try to optimize the alpha, the combining, the combining coefficient here. They can also be formed as uh, submetrics for the P. Uh, and uh, we can also optimize some weighting factors uh, when we, in, in the way of uh, forming P. We, we will have a look at uh, a multi-beam design approach to understand the two approaches in more detail. So this is uh, our, some of uh, our work uh, down back to probably 2018. Um, this is about uh, designing a multi-beam scheme to support uh, different communication and uh, sensing directions for uh, a single analog array. Because uh, sometimes we know, uh, sometimes communication is fixed in a particular direction, but a sensing we may want to look at different directions, right? So we need to support uh, the different direction requirements at the same time. And um, what we do is, um, okay, we, we fix uh, the sensing direction within one packet period, and we make it a very varying for sensing over different packets, but for communication, we make it still fixed. So that means we will need a, a multi-beam, a beam with multiple sub-beams pointing at a different directions. To achieve this, we formulated uh, a combined uh, uh, sub-precoder uh, sub form because we only have a uh, analog array here, right? So we we have the beamforming vector instead of precoding matrix here. Here we have omega TA for uh, for the sense for the communication function and uh, TS for the sensing function. We combine then using the parameters rho and uh, phi. So rho controls how the power is distributed, and the phi determines how the how the phase um, of these two are combined. And uh, based on this uh, expression, we can formulate uh, quite a different optimization problems. But before we can do that, we need to first generate uh, uh, some uh, basic uh, beam forming vectors for communication sub-beam and uh, sensing sub-beam. We applied, um, uh, developed some uh, technique based on the iterative least square. Uh, algorithm so that we can generate any shape that we want with a different, for example, with a different uh, beam with a different uh, uh, side lobes, etc. Based on uh, for uh, for a single analog antenna array, and once this basic uh, beamform vector is generated, then we can apply a phase shifting sequence to the basic one to generate a beam pointing at different directions. Then the left issue is uh, just, okay, how to optimize uh, the two parameters rho and the phi. We can formulate a different optimization problems. So for example, we can uh, formulate one based on the sensing constraint. We try to optimize um, the, we try to maximize the received uh, signal to noise ratio for communication while subject to the constraint of the beamforming gain at particular directions for sensing. We can now also formulate one under the communication constraints, right? These are just some, some optimization games. 
and um, come back to the first uh, approach of special optimization, right? We, we op optimize a single P instead of for the decompose decomposed ones. Then in this case, we can formulate a, a problem of a, what we call a global optimization problem. Here, we try to ma ma uh, maximize the receiver signal to noise ratio subject to the sensing uh, requirements constraints. Because um, in the global optimization approach, uh, usually it's quite a difficult uh, to get a closed form solutions. And uh, solving this uh, optimization problem is uh, also complicated. So this kind of uh, global optimization, uh, we think uh, they are generally not very suitable for real-time implementation, but they can be used as a um, benchmark for comparing how the suboptimal decomposed uh, approach works. Um, for the particular problem we, problem we studied, we compared uh, the approaches between the global optimization and the suboptimal decomposed ones. And uh, we found uh, their performance actually quite close, but uh, the complexity of the implementation uh, is uh, in terms of complexity, the decomposed one is much lower. For special uh, pre-code uh, optimization, in addition to those based on the beamforming gain, as we just described, it, there are also some works based on maximizing the mutual information or minimize the CIOB. For mutual information uh, of a radar, it uh, mainly represents uh, how good uh, the channel information is contained in the received signal. This uh, this is useful when we try to maximize the MI so that we can achieve the optimal pattern recognition uh, performance. Because if we maximize the information contained in the receiver signal, then we can achieve, uh, we can expect uh, the optimal performance in terms of, for example, object recognition, et cetera. But they are not uh, necessarily optimal for uh, sensing parameter estimation. So we developed uh, some optimization approaches based on the combined uh, or weighted uh, mutual information for communication and uh, radar. And then we optimized uh, the power allocation between the, the preamble and uh, the data payload part. Optimization based on CIOB has also been started, but the main issue with uh, this approach is uh, generally it's quite hard to get close to form expression for CIOB, um, mainly because of the complicated communication uh, signals in, mobile, in modern mobile networks, because we need to compute the CIOB in term, with respect to the sensing parameters, right? Uh, delay, AOA, Doppler shift, etc. Since it's quite hard to get a closed form, so it's um, quite hard to use uh, the CIOB to get some uh, closed form solution for the optima optimized uh, signal. There are a few works, uh, including our own and Professor Liu's recent ones. In our own work here, we not only studied uh, the CIOB based optimization, we also put a uh, mutual information based one together and we compared the, these two approaches, their performance, uh, their relationship, for example, in terms of for, um, the, the achieved uh, sensing performance, whether optimization based on MI is better than CIOB or whether optimizing one can lead a, uh, the optimal or nearly optimal output for the other one as well. Our solution finds some loose uh, connections between these two. And in particular, if we optimize uh, with respect to MI, generally, generally we can also expect a smaller uh, CIOB, but uh, um, it's not in the other way, which means if we minimize uh, CIOB and get the waveform. This does not guarantee we can achieve a good uh, MI. We're not uh, very sure about the reason at this stage. 
there are also some other works, uh, particular Professor Liu, they, they, uh, he has uh, some very well-known work in this uh, area based on the waveform similarity. Due to the time limit, I won't go to the details. In addition to the optimization in the special domain, we also can also optimize uh, in other domains as we briefly mentioned earlier. Okay, uh, next let's have a look at uh, the sensing parameter estimation issue. So this is a received signal as we described it, right? We have the transmitter signal, we have the uh, channel decomposed into several matrices. And um, to do sensing parameter estimation, we think there are two approaches. One approach is uh, we first remove the the transmitter signal and separate uh, the channel for different users. This uh, approach we call it as indirect sensing. And the other approach is uh, called direct sensing. So we don't uh, really separate uh, the uh, channels for different users or remove the receiver signal. And these two approaches, they have respective advantages and disadvantages. The good part for direct sensing is um, because we don't remove anything, right? So there will be no distortions or signal errors introduced. We can directly use the signal and formulate the estimation problem. But because uh, the signal is quite, it may be quite uh, uh, complicated. So the applicable sensing algorithm is quite limited. In one paper earlier, we, uh, we proposed the approach based on block compressive sensing for this type of direct sensing. And uh, to be able to apply indirect sensing, we needed to be able to, uh, for example, remove the transmitter signals, right? In this case, uh, we can see we, we needed to have a matrix inversion operation with respect to the transmitter signal. In, in So to make this uh, approach work, we first, uh, needed to make sure this matrix is uh, invertible. And um, this means we need to receive sufficient uh, signals. And uh, this reversion, we also introduce uh, some uh, arrows because this is uh, similar to the, what we know as uh, zero forcing equalization. Uh, it's just uh, we try to remove a channel and uh, here we try to remove this transmitter signals. But uh, the effect uh, will be similar. If this matrix is uh, near singular, then we will have very large uh, noise enhancement problem. So this is uh, the potential issue with the indirect sensing. And uh, because of this operation, we say, okay, if this uh, transmitter signal, they are orthogonal, then it will not introduce uh, uh, noise enhancement. And the operation of a matrix inversion is quite simple, right? So this would be a good approach if we have orthogonal signals. For example, we have orthogonal uh, channel training sequence. But for data symbols, this may not be a very good option. All right, referring to the case of indirect sensing, we can actually get a clear channel for each user and we can formulate the channel in this form. And this is a well-known expression. Um, in, in the signal processing domain, it's known as a 4D harmonic retrieval problem. We have 40 signals. And there are many approaches can be potentially applied. For example, the simplest one is based on the multi-dimension FFT. And um, the next one may be on grid compressive sensing. We have done quite a, quite a lot of work on the on grid compressive sensing algorithm for sensing PMA network. And then the performance looks quite good. And uh, more importantly, this type of algorithm, they do not require a regular signal. So they can deal with uh, the complicated uh, resource uh, location resulted uh, signal structure. In this sense, we think this is a very good option for sensing. And there are also other approaches. Um, we can say we can see they have uh, disadvantages in terms of complexity or the sensing performance. There's not a, there's no a very good uh, trade-off between uh, these two. Subspace methods include uh, traditional 
techniques, uh, for example, music and esprit. Esprit uh, also does not require regular signals. Oh, sorry, music also does not require regular signals. They, so they are also a good option. Music is also a good option for sensing in, in PMM. Here is a simple result demonstrating the potentials of these uh, algorithms. So this is the period diagram result. We can see the Doppler um, estimation is quite rough um, and the resolution in terms of the speed is quite low. But if we look at the result uh, obtained from the 2D compressive sensing and uh, even 1D compressive sensing, we can see the results are quite uh, good. The red circles are for the uh, true ground truth and the blue star they are for the uh, estimates. Um, I also touch briefly on the uh, OT phase uh, solution. OT phase is a good uh, modulation schemes or signaling schemes for joint uh, communication and sensing system because uh, uh, it modulates the signal in the delay Doppler domain, which uh, has good match with the, the delay and uh, Doppler parameters that we want to estimate in sensing. But the one major issue with OTA phase is uh, generally their resolution is quite limited because they are on grid uh, uh, system. They modulate, the, they modulate the data symbols in, uh, in grid uh, or quantized uh, delay and the Doppler values. So if we estimate directly these uh, channels in the delay Doppler domain, then we can only get a very coarse resolution. So the major challenge in OTA phase JCAS is how to get uh, fine resolution estimations using the signal structure. Okay, um, the resolution of sensing ambiguity, this is a very important problem uh, because uh, if we can come out with uh, some good solution, then we can enable uplink sensing without uh, incurring any major cost, without requiring modifying the network. So here shows uh, one example how the uh, timing offset will impact uh, the sensing, right? Uh, we have the propagation delay, but we also have the time offset caused by the clock uh, asynchronism between these two nodes. So for communication, they are treated as a single one, but for sensing, the time offset will introduce uh, the ranging ambiguity. So we have to resolve this uh, issue. And uh, there are some existing solutions. Uh, we may be able to divide them into network-based and uh, single node uh, ones. Network-based uh, ones, we can use, uh, for example, the triangulation method in localization to remove the timing offset. But this approach, they cannot uh, remove the random phase shift associated with, uh, for example, each uh, packet. And for single node, uh, uh, we can exploit, uh, exploit the fact that uh, the offsets uh, between different antennas, be between different antennas, receive antennas, they are the same. So if we compute the uh, conjugate uh, cross correlation between antennas, or we compute uh, the ratio between multiple antennas, then we can get rid of these uh, offsets. Right? So this is the basic uh, fact exploited in the most of the current single node based uh, resolution, uh, the sensing ambiguity resolution algorithms. We will quickly have a look at a few. So this is uh, the basic receiver signal and this is a cross correlation. Right? So we can uh, see the timing offsets and the frequency offsets, they are removed in the output of the, of the cross correlation. But the issue is they introduce uh, double the terms because we have two AL terms here and uh, all the delay and uh, Doppler shift, they become relative measurements because they are with respect to the reference antenna. Uh, so we need to resolve this issue in the cross antenna cross correlation approach. 
existing one mainly based on the one called add and minus, which adds one signal to the uh, reference uh, signal, reference signal from uh, antenna, signal from the reference antenna and minus uh, one constant uh, in the other antenna. Then in this case, they uh, many of the work show that uh, quite often they can remove the image component. But, but we found that this doesn't always work well. So instead of using the add minus before the CA cross antenna cross correlation, we actually developed a new technique called a mirrored music algorithm. Because, um, because uh, the, the component as we see here, they are mirrored, right? Because if we uh, use the AOM and the AOM0 with different values, we will, we will see mirrored uh, components for delay and Doppler shift. So instead of only uh, use the existing music algorithm directly, we actually define the basis vector in the music algorithm in the um, mirrored form. In this case, we can reduce uh, the unknown parameter, parameter from 2L back to L. And we can also resolve the ambiguity uh, due to the imaginary components here. We also developed another technique to resolve the timing ambiguity issue. Uh, this is based on the idea of exploiting the line of sight path components. Uh, Cause the current uh, technique mainly they remove or loss component components and uh, then deal with uh, the byproduct components. But we found if we exploit the line of sight components, we actually can, can construct a metric which uh, does not have the image uh, components. And uh, in this way, we can ac obtain accurate uh, Doppler estimates. And after obtaining the Doppler estimates, then we can construct uh, um, a metric for AOA and uh, delay estimation. So we have developed a real-time demonstrator based on this approach, which can do real-time single object uh, tracking. We have the tracking videos available from my home page. All right, the last uh, solution I would like to mention is uh, the work uh, from uh, Professor Da Qing Zhang from Beijing University. They have done a lot of work based on the CSI ratio, which is the ratio between signal from two antennas. So they can represent the ratio as this form, where the change of distance is only contained in here. And they show a good relationship, a beautiful relationship between the change of this distance and the CSI ratio. And they can estimate in which uh, direction the distance is changing, whether it's increasing or it's reducing. They have applied this approach to uh, brief the detection and show very good uh, results. They claim that uh, this approach can achieve much higher SINR compared to the conjugate uh, multiplication approach before, but, uh, uh, um, but uh, I haven't uh, seen a strict proof for this claim. So maybe this is remain as remaining as an open problem. All right, this uh, comes to the conclusion. We have shown that uh, PMN is a very promising solution. It can achieve uh, downlink and uplink sensing uh, consist uh, or matching with uplink and downlink uh, communication. And uh, we expect it uh, to deliver a revolutionarily unique uh, sensing solution without uh, compromising the communication performance. Of course, there are a lot of challenges ahead and uh, let's uh, try our best to make it happen as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Okay, so thanks Andrew for the uh, wonderful talk and um, we have received a number of questions, but we since we only have uh, limited time, so we'll just uh, name one person to ask her his or her question. So, uh, Stefan Stephen Schiller. So please, Stefan, can you ask your yeah, question? Hi. Can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, okay, great. So, um, 
My first question is regarding the direct parameter estimation. Um, that is, how would you, for, for example, I'm picturing a, a scenario with, um, in the uplink, for example, the position with the uh, one base state. Then you, how would you perform direct sensing there? Because I mentioned that would be different channels, and different channels would be, of course, composed of different parameters. So if you were to do the sensing there. Um, sorry, your voice is not very reliable. I cannot hear it very oh, clearly. <laughs> so, so maybe I can I can repeat Stefan's question. So he's asking how would one perform the task of direct uh, parameter estimation when the receive the signal is composed of different channels. So how can we estimate parameters of these channels in a joint fashion? Um, we, we, we use the approach called a block compressive sensing. Uh, and uh, we for, basically we formulate uh, the signal in the channel and uh, together with the signal, transmit the signal in this form. And then we can treat them as a dictionary of, uh, in the compressive sensing. Yeah, so this can include uh, all the signals coming, all the signals and channels coming from different users. So this is a basic uh, signal formulation. But that would mean you still estimate the parameters of the different channels individually, right? No, we estimate them together. But when, yeah, okay, you estimate them together, but they are different parameters for each channel, right? They can be different or they can represent the common reflection. Okay, okay. Yeah, Thanks. because some users, they may share some channel uh, or at least uh, uh, reflection may come from the same object, et cetera. So there are some- Okay, but how do you do the matching? I mean, how would you know that the, the objects are the same? There, I mean, there are signals. There are signals where we will be able to separate uh, them directly because we have the signals from the different uh, transmitters here. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I guess I have to read up on it in the paper. That seems like yeah, so there's a no no matching problem here because we okay. use the, the transmitter signal directly. Okay, um, yep. and maybe just another quick question. I hope my voice is okay now. Um, what do you mean by tensor-based methods for parameter estimation? I think that was two slides later. Yeah, tensor-based ones. This one. Um, chronicle plus compressive sensing. Okay, that is tensor based then. Uh, this is not a tensor based ones. This is just a two D compressive sensing. Okay, but uh, I was I was just wondering what do you mean by tensor based methods? Like, uh, if we, if we, if if we apply tensor based methods, then we can uh, do the sensing directly in high dimension, uh, high, high dimension, for high dimension signals. Yeah, sure, but you don't have like a concrete algorithm in, in mind when you, for, for the example. Uh, we also tried some tensor-based uh, techniques, uh, but uh, because of the complexity is quite high, so uh, in, when we assess uh, the performance and the complexity, we think uh, 2D ones are, 2D ones are better options. Yeah, I think the, the, the interesting part about the tensor-based methods is that you don't have like a matching problem with the parameters afterwards. Right? Yeah, in this, uh, in this 2D approach, uh, because we only interest in estimate uh, three parameters, the delay, Doppler, and uh, AOA, so we can directly estimate uh, the, uh, uh, the third one. Right, two D can only directly estimate two, but we can use the estimated results to get the third one directly. So there's no matching problem as well here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So uh, thanks, Stefan. So maybe we still have one minute. So maybe I will have a quick question. I think. So, so, so Andrew, you are talking about uh, using uh, pilot and a data payload to do sensing. So we know if you are going to do, for example, uplink sensing, 
And if you want to exploit the data payload, then maybe we, we need to do some uh, strategy like sensing after decoding, right? So after decoding the data. So yeah. my question is, uh, so, so I think this, uh, there are some scenarios for this. For example, if I had the uh, low SNR, then the data cannot be you know, decoded uh, uh, you know, at, at high accuracy. So maybe that is not helpful for sensing. And uh, in high SNR, you uh, you know you have already very high SNR at the pilot. Maybe the data payload will only give you marginal improvements in the sensing accuracy. So uh, in that case, what do you think about uh, you know which, which scenario will be uh, suitable for this strategy sensing after decoding? Yeah, that's a very very good uh, question, and uh, you have very good uh, points here as well. I, I think. Um, uh, using data payload cannot uh, cannot only introduce uh, benefits in terms of the signal to noise ratio. Of course, it can increase the signal power and uh, then increase the SNR. It can also avoid uh, some issues maybe related to the resolution ambiguity, because um, if the interval between the samples are, are too large, we may not be able to estimate some, for example, small uh, Doppler shift. But if we use the whole packet, then we can actually improve the resolution. And uh, this mm -hmm. is one benefit, uh, additional benefit in terms of the SNR. And uh, in terms of the application of the data payload at a low SNR case, we may be able to incorporate decoding in the loop because uh, using decoding, we can largely minimize uh, or reduce the demodulation bit error or the error mm -hmm. bit error rate. And also recall that um, the the error generally may be only like one percent at the most if for, for communication, right? One percent error may be a big issue for communication, but for sensing, it's only introducing like a, a one percent error in terms of the signal. So okay. the I think the BR error in communication and the error in in terms of sensing is quite different. Yeah, yeah, that's a very yeah. good point. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. So um, I think I will begin to introduce the next speaker. So yeah. thanks again, okay. Andrew, and uh, you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you all for all the audience for your participation. Okay. And uh, so our next speaker will be. Uh, professor Imin Daniel Zhang. So uh, Imin Daniel Zhang is an associate professor at the uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Temple University. So he graduated from Xidian University, China, and received his PhD from the University of uh, Tsukuba, Japan. His research interests lie in the areas of statistical signal processing and reprocessing information theory, machine learning, compressive sensing, convex optimization, and the time frequency analysis with respect uh, with applications in radar, communication, and satellite. And he's an uh, associate editor of HVOE TAES and for Elsevier signal processing, and served as an associate editor for HVOE TSP. He's a member of the uh, signal processing theory and methods technical committee, and was a member of the uh, sensor area and multi-channel signal processing technical committee. So um, he received the 2017 uh, AESS Harry Rowe Mimino Award for article signaling strategy for dual function radar communication and overview. So this is a very famous paper in our area. And his publications on sparse and redesigned uh, sparsity-based DOA estimation received the uh, 2018 HV Signal Processing Society Young Author Best of Paper Award and the 2019 IET Communications Premium Award and the 2021 Eurosip Best of Paper Award for Signal Processing. And he is a fellow of FEE and a fellow of SPIE. So, Professor Zhang, I will hand over to you and please go ahead. Hello? Yes. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, yes, we can. I think I have a little bit. Uh, 
more here, right? Okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Fan, for your kind of introduction. And uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So the title of my presentation is Signaling Strategies and Array Processing for Sensing and Communications. So I will break down my talk into three parts. The first one is joint radar communications. I'm going to focus on signaling strat strategies, sorry. And then the second part is radar communication coexistence. And my focus will be robust beamforming and the direction of arrival estimation. And the third part, time permitting, I will talk about passive radar. Uh, my focus will be sparsity-based imaging, localization, and space-time adaptive processing. So as everyone knows, um, radio frequency spectrum is a finite resource to be shared by a number of applications. And the explosive growth in wireless communications and other applications result in soared demand for wireless broadband, making spectrum increasingly congested. So spectrum sharing among disparate wireless systems is a solution to this problem. And the particular interest would be um, between radar and the communication uh, systems because of their heavy use. So many different ways uh, can be considered for spectrum sharing. Uh, for example, joint radar communications that can uh, be divided into radar-centric and the communication-centric. And the coexistence, uh, so in this case, radar and the communication subsystems would transmit uh, respective waveforms and also passive radar. And in this case, radar will use the uh, signals of opportunity and for which it does not have a control. Okay, so in the first part, I'm going to talk about the joint radar uh, communications. So in this case, the transmitter system is shared by radar and the communication functions. So the apparent advantages include the effective use of the signal spectrum and the hardware. And also uh, it's uh, generated no or minimum mutual interference because the same transmitter system is shared. And the joint radar communication systems can be communication centric. So in this case, we achieve the radar sensing function in a primary communication system. A good example would be automotive radar that use the IEEE 802.11 family signals designed for wireless network and use them for uh, sensing purposes. And we can also um, consider radar centric uh, case. So in this case, the communication information is embedded to a primary radar system and that will be the focus of my uh, uh, first part of the material. So before I talk about uh, information embedding, I would uh, briefly introduce how radar works. So a typical pulse radar would periodically transmit this, uh, the same probing waveform, and a <coughs> excuse me, a commonly used uh, waveform is the linear FM waveform. So we can see here we can transmit these waveforms and periodically, and for then for each waveform, when the waveform hit a target, then we are going to receive the return signal. And uh, so we sample the signal uh, in the so-called fast time, and then we can perform match the filtering, or in the later terminology, we also say it's a pulse compression. So as a result, the the linear FM signal will be um, returned to a narrow pulse. So in this way, we can detect where the target is in terms of the, we, we can get the range information of the target. And then after that, we do the free transform over the signal we, we received corresponding to different pulses. And then we can get the Doppler information. So for example, in this uh, uh, so-called range Doppler map, we can see there are two targets and uh, we can identify their range and also their Doppler frequency. So in other words, in radar application, we have different dimensions of the signals we can use. So apparently we have the fast time and also the slow time and also the spatial uh, domain when we use an array. 
So what it, what the domain we can use and how we can embed the information really depends on uh, the whole different complexity, but also how much the reader uh, would be flexibly accept this kind of changes. So for example, when we consider uh, in the first time, um, the traditional uh, radar systems uh, use the linear FM uh, signal. And uh, then we can modify this to use the coded sparse frequency, or in other words, we can also call that as frequency hopping. So by changing the hopping pattern, we can embed the information. We can also use the OFDM that's popularly used in both communications and the radar. So OFDM signal can carry different informations. And we can also consider phase modulation continuous waveform uh, to carry uh, information in each symbol. So the factors you need to consider uh, in, in, in embedding information in a radar system, uh, we need to consider several factors. So for example, we need to consider whether the convolution um, between the transmitter waveform and the receiver filter would maintain identical for each pulses. Or whether you would accept a wideband IF signal after demodulation or um, match the filtering. Or whether you can accept a high peak to average power ratio. Or what kind of ambiguity function you would uh, accept. So we can also consider an uh, information embedding in slow time. And for example, in this very old paper um, published uh, half century ago, uh, uses uh, uh, on off of several slow time pulses. And then with that pattern, you can carry information. You can change the phase of these uh, uh, pulses to carry information. We can also carry information in the spatial domain for example, by changing the side lobe levels and by changing the phase, and also you can use the index modulation by turning off a few, uh, some of the antennas. So we mainly focus on the spatial domain signaling that does not require major changes to the radar signal waveforms and the receive structure. So we are going to consider um, the, to maintain the radar main beam beam patterns. We are not going to change the, the main beam patterns, but we are going to carry the information in the side lobe region and also, or in the uh, signal phase. So let's consider a very simple case and we have a, a, a single uh, communication user and uh, at the direction of uh, theta C and that lies in the side lobe region of the radar operation and the steering vector is a theta c. Okay, so we can design two beam forming vectors w1 and w2 and such that when you use w1 the the array gain towards the direction of the communication signal is delta h is a high level and whereas if you use a w2 uh, the level will be lower. So by using this high low, you can embed the information uh, toward the direction of the communication uh, signals. So for example, we can design uh, W1 using uh, this uh, optimization based design to make sure that the array gain in the radar uh, region and uh, remain lower region would remain the, uh, the same as desired. Uh, this GD theta, right? That's the that's the desired beam pattern. Whereas in the side lobe regions, the uh, array gain would be below a certain threshold. And then we can design for the specific direction of the communication direction that will uh, get this uh, delta H. And also we can similarly design W2 such that these uh, conditions are the same, but this one will be delta L. Okay, so in this way, we can see here for this example, the delta H, H is minus 20 dB and my delta L is minus 50 dB. So by switching between W1 and the W2, the radar function is not affected because both of them provide the same uh, main beam pattern, whereas the side lobe levels are changed. So the communication user can detect whether this is a high and a low. By doing this, we can uh, embed the information. Okay, so the output, uh, the, the transmitted signal will be either this term or this term, and the B is the information bit binary number zero or one to, trans to control this. And then we can also 
um, design multiple orthogonal waveforms and such that to, uh, independent information can be carried in each of these subcarriers to carry more information. So when we look at this kind of scheme, we can design them to support multiple communication users. For example, in this example, uh, we uh, have uh, three communication users in the direction of minus 50 degree, minus 30 degree, and 40 degree. So in all these directions, we achieve a very really low BER. Whereas we see that the BER at other directions are very really high, that means this system is secure against eavesdropping in other directions. Okay, so when we look at this kind of a scheme, one problem definitely is this is for only for side lobe uh, communication. So we cannot uh, communicate in the main lobe of the radar operation. And also it will be sensitive to channel fading because we are using the amplitude. So we can also consider phase-based information embedding. Uh, so we can, carry the info, uh, we can carry the information in the phase uh, of the waveform. So in this case, we can deliver information to boost the main lob beam um, and also the side lobe regions of the radar operation. And it's less sensitive to the channel fading or say the magnitude variation of the channel. So one thing we need to um, consider in this case is that if you only consider one pulse and uh, then you have to uh, carry on a reference phase information so that the receiver can understand what's the phase because uh, if you just send a pulse, the, the receiver just cannot understand uh, what's the phase because there is no phase reference. So one way we can do is that you can send out this information to carry the, the, the information. And also you can send another waveform at the same time, they are orthogonal and you can carry uh, this term will carry the reference phase information so you can understand what the information is carried here. And uh, apparently we can also modify uh, this kind of work to higher constellation. For example, we can use the QAM uh, modulation. And uh, in this case, the information can be carried in both the amplitude and also the phase. And we can also uh, design the beam pattern such that the different magnitude or phase will be delivered to different users. So definitely in this case, we need to uh, design a high number of uh, um, waveforms, or I say the beam, uh, um, this beam uh, forming weights. So to support the C communication users with a form of L amplitude levels and the Q distinct phases, we needed to generate uh, uh, N equals to LQ of power C uh, beam forming vectors. And then in this case, in total, we can carry uh, C of log two LQ bit uh, per pulse. Okay, and we can also, you know, if the array is large, we can also consider antenna selection to reduce the number of our RF chains. So one way we can do is we keep all these uh, uh, kind of requirements uh, in terms of the main beam and in terms of the side lobe and in terms of uh, these uh, information. And, uh, but at, at the same time, we can minimize the total power and also the sparsity or say the group sparsity of the, the weights because we are designing many different uh, uh, beam um, uh, uh, beam forming weights, right? So for example, if we have beam form one, beam form two, so in this case, we, 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 we uh, jointly design their sparsity so such that this antenna and these two antennas can be turned off. So uh, to have a quick remarks on the first part, joint radar communications, and we consider the information embedding uh, in radar centric systems. And in general, radar centric information embedding can use the fast time, slow time, and the spatial domain resources in the radar system. We mainly focused on the spatial domain information embedding because that requires minimum modification uh, to the existing radar uh, operations and uh, radar systems. However, other forms of information embedding are possible as radar systems become more flexible in accepting different operation modes and the system configurations. Okay, so the second part, I will talk about the radar communication coexistence. And coexistence of uh, radar and the communication systems 
would permit more flexible operating uh, operations. So one problem is that mutual interference would exist between radar and the communication systems because they are transmitting their own respective waveforms. So it is important to perform robust beamforming to mitigate mutual interference. So we consider a really uh, general and simple uh, receive array signal uh, model. So in this case, we have uh, XT, we have uh, the design signal component and the interference component and the noise component. So apparently when you design a beamformer, the goal is to get the output of YT and then that should be as close as possible to the uh, desired signal. So, um, a really effective uh, beamformer is the MVDR that uh, minimizes the interference plus noise power while keeping the desired signal unaffected. So we can see here, it's trying to minimize this and this represents the uh, power of the interference plus noise and uh, this RG plus N is interference plus noise coherence matrix. And then the uh, constraint is that the array response in the direction of the design signal is one. That means that the design signal is unaffected. And this solution is well known to be given by in this explanation. So this is the inversion of the in, in, in interference plus noise uh, coherence matrix and multiplied by the steering vector of the design signal. Uh, in practice, people may feel the uh, estimation of the interference plus noise coherence matrix is difficult. So in this case, we can replace uh, this with the data coherence matrix. And then in this case, we call that as the MPDR because it it's, will minimize the output of the power instead of the uh, output interference plus noise power. And we still have the same constraint and the solution is given by a very really similar uh, format, but this term is uh, replaced by the inverse of the coherence matrix. So MPDR is commonly used because it's easier to implement and it's equivalent to MVDR in the static sense when we have the accurate estimation of the coherence matrix and also the steering vector of the design signal. However, MPDR is not robust and its performance degrades uh, when the estimation, uh, when the estimated coherence matrix our XX hat is inaccurate, uh, for example, um, because of insufficient uh, data snapshots. Or the presumed uh, design signal, the steering vector is inaccurate, uh, maybe due to imperfect estimation, or maybe due to the multipass feeding or calibration errors. So in this case, there are a number of uh, robust beamforming techniques being uh, developed by looking at the current matrix and also the steering vector. So for example, the diagonal loading approach, uh, look at the uh, coherence matrix by adding a diagonal uh, term to make the beamform more, more robust. And whereas the worst case of beamforming, uh, look at the steering vector. So it still minimizes the uh, total power output, uh, but uh, in, instead of uh, constraint in the direction of the design signal because this steering vector may have errors. So it constrains such that uh, around the steering vector, uh, the output, or say the array gain would be at least one. So in this case, uh, signals around the presumed steering vector will not be suppressed. So um, we propose, um, a robust adaptive beamforming based on the reconstruction of the interference plus noise coherence matrix. So the idea is to estimate the DOA and the power information of each signal. And then we, uh, we say reconstruct the interference plus noise coherence matrix based on the estimated power information and also the uh, steering vector in this way. And so in this way, we can exclude the uh, contribution of the design signal and um, by either excluding uh, that component or if you know the region of the design signal, you can also exclude in uh, this component. So in this way, we can reconstruct the interference plus noise uh, current matrix to perform robust beamforming. So we can show um, some uh, simple examples. 
So here we have a 10 a uniform, a 10 sensor uniform linear array with one design signal. And the presumed direction is a five degree. And we also have two uh, interferers from minus 50 degree and minus 20 degree. And we only use the 30 snapshots. So we can see here for the first example, the uh, direction of the design signal actually has a certain uncertainty and up to four degree. And so the actual uh, design signal will come from uh, any point between one degree and nine degree. Um, so in this case, we can see that many um, methods, including these uh, uh, di diagonal loading, uh, this one here, and also uh, the worst case uh, here, actually they do not provide a good performance and as SN, the input SNR increases, whereas our method provides uh, the performance very really close to the optimum case. We can also look at the case when the design signal has a coherent or incoherent local scattering means that the design signal is corrupted by multi pass and we can still get a really, uh, really good results, okay? That's uh, close to the uh, optimum uh, uh, output signal to interference plus noise ratio. Okay, and we um, also, if the steering vector has a mismatch, we can also estimate the true steering vector by minimizing uh, this result. So this uh, uh, result, we are minimizing the output uh, interference plus noise uh, uh, power, but because AS here, AS bar here is uh, the presumed one, that's not necessarily the, 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 the correct one. So we add an orthogonal component here, and this term E is orthogonal to this presumed um, design signal steering vector, and such that we minimize this term. And uh, then in this, this way, we can find out what's the, this uh, error term. And then as, the, as a result, this AS plus E would be uh, the estimation of the true steam vector and that can be used to improve the uh, beamforming performance. So here we show an example, which is not for radar, but for really astronomy and in the presence of uh, uh, interference. And we use so-called adaptive angular response. Actually, this is common, one of the commonly used methods in radio astronomy. So we have the true image here uh, that we uh, uh, used to generate the data. And then we see here, this is a mismatched AR image and this is the worst case AR image. Uh, and this is our proposed method. So we can see uh, by using the, this proposed method, uh, we can achieve a much better uh, imaging results. Okay, so as we see, like to uh, apply this method, we need to estimate the DOA and also the power. So in the next piece, I'm going to talk about the DOA estimation with the focus on sparse array and the sparsity based DOA estimation. So for sparse arrays, uh, the difference lags between sensor position will yield a large virtual array. So we can consider a uniform linear array possibly with missing elements. For example, here I have a uniform linear array with four sensors. And then when you calculate the, the, the delays, or I say the lags, and then from here, you can get uh, lag zero and lag one between them, or lag two between these, and or lag three between them. And definitely you can reverse the, the, the direction so you can get the lag between minus three to three. Whereas if you look at uh, this array, uh, it's really similar. The only thing is I removed this sensor. So now I only have three sensors. And if you look at this one, we can also calculate lag zero, lag one, and lag two, and lag three. So actually I can still get the same uh, lags. So in this case, we call that these two arrays are core array, or say more specifically difference the core array uh, uh, equivalent. And if you look at the coherence matrix, a four sensor array can form a four by four coherence matrix. And then when we remove this sensor and when we consider this three sensor sparse array, now we need to remove this column and this row. However, we know that for uniform linear array, the coherence matrix has a toplets and a Hermitian property. That means this element will be the same as this. So we can copy this one to here and to here. 
And similarly, we can also copy this element to here. So in this way, we can fill in all these uh, uh, elements in the four by four matrix. And uh, so again, from the three sensor sparse array, we can still reconstruct the four by four Corinth matrix. Okay, so um, consider uh, a signal model. We have a Q on correlate signals uh, impinging from theta one to theta Q. So the received signal model, we can represent as XT equal the summation of these contributions. And we can also write as A as T plus NT. So this is a very standard array model. And then we calculate the current matrix of XT. We get RXX and equal to A RSSA emission where RSS is the current matrix of the sources. And for uncorrelated sources, this will become a diagonal matrix. So if we vectorize Rxx, then we get vector Z as such that this can be represented as A tilde B and plus uh, this uh, uh, sigma n square and I tilde, where the tilde A will contain columns. That's the chronic product of the original steno vector and then its conjugate. And uh, so in this way, if we look at the Z amongst a receive array of a virtual sensor or a virtual array, and what we can call that as a difference array. So in this case, the manifold matrix, this A tier that actually is expanded because we are using a chronic product here uh, or that corresponding to the uh, lags we talked about in the previous page. The, the problem is that in this case, we do not have any time snapshot anymore. So we only have a single snapshot. Okay, so now the problem is how we should we design the sparse array and how should we perform uh, the estimation uh, from this kind of co-array data? So actually this is sparse array and sparsely based estimation uh, now is very popular. And uh, if you look at the timeline, and in 1950s and 1960s, the concept of so-called minimum redundancy array was developed and then followed by the minimum whole array in 1970s. And then a, a significant breakthrough was made by the uh, Caltech uh, group to develop systematic sparse array design uh, represented by the nested array and the core prime array. And uh, that's around the 2010. And uh, so they use the music and the spatial smoothing methods. So the problem is they only use, they can only utilize the consecutive legs. And uh, also a very uh, significant event is in 2013, uh, Office of Naval Research launched a program to support core prime sampling that uh, propelled the um, research and the development in this, uh, uh, this topic. And in 2015, we developed the generalized core prime array and also used the sparsity based DU estimation. So in this way, we can utilize all the lags, um, not only the consecutive lags. And in 2019, uh, we uh, developed to use the array interpolation. In this way, we can fill in missing sensor positions. And then recently we proposed the use of redundance free sparse arrays. So um, this is uh, yeah, the minimum uh, redundancy array and uh, was initially talked about in 1955 and then uh, 1968. And uh, then again in 2010 and, and uh, 11, uh, so the Caltech group developed the core prime array and also nested array. And uh, so the core prime array actually used the two uh, sub arrays and uh, was here M and N are core prime. And so one array, one subarray used N sensors uh, with MD spacing, whereas the other one used M sensors with ND spacing. So when you put it together, you can get the difference core lags, like uh, uh, difference lags like this. And here we can see that these lags are consecutive, whereas here we have some holes, basically in the lag domain, they are missing. So um, they proposed to use the music-based DU estimation. And then because we know now for the uh, uh, core domain, we only have the Z, we only have one snapshot. So apparently ZZ emission is not a full rank. So we need to perform spatial smoothing to restore a full rank commerce matrix so we can apply music. And for this purposes, 
uh, to perform spatial smoothing, we can only use the consecutive legs. So for in this case, we can only use the legs between minus nine to nine, whereas other legs we have to uh, discard. So we propose to use a sparsity-based uh, DO estimation. In this way, all the legs can be used because we do not need to perform spatial smoothing. And also in this direction, uh, we designed the two generalized core prime uh, arrays and that will allow a, sparse, a very flexible sparse array design. And also actually that opened the door for many other uh, sparse array design to follow. So here, the Kansas uh, compresses the inter element spacing of one sub array. And in this way, we can achieve more consecutive legs. Whereas the Candice, we put these two sub arrays in a collinear way and uh, we can increase the unique legs. Uh, we can also reduce the mutual, uh, mutual coupling. And uh, then uh, in 2018, we developed uh, uh, the array interpretation technique for sparse arrays. So in this way, the missing interest in the coherence matrix uh, can be interpreted through matrix completion and exploiting the topless property. So for example, if we have a, uh, an array uh, of three sensors here, we have this position here, this position here, and another position here. So if we reconstruct coherence matrix, we would have uh, like this. So we only have nine elements of field and whereas all other elements are missing. So when we utilize the topless property of the current matrix, then we can fill in these positions by just copying the, the values here and to here and to, to here. And so in this way, we fill the most of the elements in the current matrix. However, we still have a few elements missing. So what we can do is we can use the uh, matrix completion to fill in all these positions such that we can reconstruct, the, in this case, the five by five ma occurrence matrix, we only uh, use only three sensors. So mathematically, we can formulate this one into this uh, uh, formulation. So here we minimize the rank of the current matrix. We reconstruct it from this one column vector that we needed to optimize. And uh, constraint that for these uh, observed missing samples, the, the resulting current matrix should have similar interests. And here the rank operation is non-convex, but can be relaxed into um, convex uh, nuclear norm uh, of this. So as a result, because we obtained the full current matrix and the result with supported DOA, uh, gridless DO estimation using, for example, DOA, and uh, it's more robust to noise. And, and uh, in the case, when we have a small number of uh, samples. Okay, and recently uh, we are um, discussing the optimized the redundancy free sparse array design. Uh, so in this case, because we, you know, we can use the array interpolation. So really the array does not have to generate a consecutive legs. And it's more important to have redundancy free uh, so in this way, we can achieve highest degrees of freedom. So by redundancy free, we mean that all the non-zero lags would appear at most once. And again, because the array interpretation allowed holes, so we can uh, use this kind of approach to further add degrees of freedom and also to reduce the mutual coupling. So what we are going to do is we minimize the, the position of the last sensor means the aperture, and we can uh, specify the desired array aperture. We can also specify the minimum uh, separation between two uh, antennas. And this one involves uh, uh, integers in the optimization. So we have to use the uh, mixed integer program. And for example, here we show um, the minimum redundancy array using six antennas and the minimum whole array and also our proposed method. Uh, so we can see that actually the aperture, we specify the aperture of 22 and also we specify that the minimum spacing is 2D between sensors. So we do not have a significant mutual coupling and also we get to the highest uh, uh, degrees of freedom to compare with them. So we can achieve more sources and particular but also, if you look at the effect of mutual coupling, uh, these two arrays are sensitive, whereas our proper method is really uh, insensitive. Um, 
we, when you have a larger array, uh, for example, in like mass MIMO, we can also reduce the number of RF chains, right? You are using a large number of antennas, but we can reduce the number of RF chains by compress the result. So we can put an um, um, analog compress sampling matrix phi to reduce the number from the uh, N antennas and the two M RF chains. And so we can design or say, optimize this phi by uh, minimizing the mutual information between the signal theta and also the compressed output y. And uh, so we can see that, for example, if we have 50 antennas and we reduce them into 10 alpha chains, we can still get a very robust DU estimation for, the, for this example, we have nine sources. And also very really interestingly, uh, because we are using the compression to focus, so I said to, uh, uh, to uh, yeah, focus the uh, our beam actually or say uh, toward the uh, desires uh, toward the signals, we can achieve actually better performance when you have uh, when that signal to noise ratio is low or it only requires less number of a snapshot compared with the uh, the 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 uncompressed case. And we can also actually show that uh, you know uh, these days that uh, we are. Uh, many people are interested in deep learning. And uh, we can also show that actually deep learning is really effective to provide the robust DO estimation and the uh, channel estimation. And we consider that a partially calibrated distributed array. And uh, then by training a neural network to perform DO estimation with, with antenna gain and phase errors, we can achieve a robust uh, uh, DO estimation. Whereas if we do not, uh, uh, have this kind of capability, say conventional music would, uh, uh, would not be able to uh, estimate uh, uh, the DOS in the presence of the uh, antenna gain and the phase errors. So for the remarks of the second part, um, radar communication coexistence, um, the coexistence of different wireless systems definitely introduce mutual interference. And we consider robust beam forming to enable effective interference cancellation and the desired signal preservation. And the DOS emissions was uh, long considered as a radar task, but uh, now apparently people in the uh, communication community also realize that it's an important part of a communication uh, to perform robust beam forming and also channel estimation. So sparse array designs and sparsity-based processing would provide great potentials to enhance sensing and communication capability and performance uh, improvements with reduced uh, complexity. And machine learning methods definitely can be trained to uh, provide robust uh, beam forming and view estimation in uh, uh, adapt environment changes and also calibration errors. Okay, so in the third part, I'm going to talk about past radar. So I think I don't have a, a much time, so I will skip uh, some of the materials. So past radar will uh, exploit the signals of opportunity that are designed for other applications, such as broadcasting, wireless communications, and the satellite navigation. So the advantages include no dedicated spectrum will be needed for radar because the uh, uh, radar does not have to transmit anything. And uh, you can have a low cost implementation because you, you only have receivers and uh, you can achieve so-called multi-mode and multi-static diversity because you can collect the uh, transmit information maybe from broadcast, from satellite, uh, satellite navigation. So you can gather different kinds of uh, signals and also you can achieve multi-static uh, diversity means you can have uh, multiple uh, bi-static pairs. Um, you can have silent electromagnetic operation and that's particularly attractive for military applications because you can fly the, uh, the radar uh, to, uh, really close to the battlefield. The disadvantages includes the signal bandwidth is typically narrow uh, for, for broadcasting and wireless communications and the waveforms are not optimized for radar sensing. And also because the uh, sources are through the party, so the reader does not have a control. And in the worst case, the sources can be turned off and the reader cannot operate. 
So this one is a little old, but the list uh, different kind of uh, sources we can use, uh, range from like FM and the digital audio broadcast and uh, and the TV. And apparently, digital TV actually is a preferred uh, operation for many uh, passive data systems. So anyway, this table gives uh, like this kind of sources with a different frequency band and the modulation scheme and bandwidth and also the transmit of power. So a typical radar. Uh, would uh, have two parts. One part is the surveillance channel trying to get the uh, target information, whereas the reference antenna trying to get the information of the uh, transmitted signal because the radar does not have the transmitted signal to perform uh, uh, various uh, operations. So we mainly consider the sparsity and the group sparsity based processing um, for passive radar. Um, because uh, radar signals has a low bandwidth, as we just talked about. On the other hand, it has the availability of multiple sources of, of opportunity. And also the things are often sparse, particularly when we are interested in moving targets. And so we have demonstrated the usefulness of sparsity and group sparsity based uh, techniques for radar imaging and uh, moving target tracking or localization and the cloud separation. So if you're interested, we have a tutorial on giving in 2019 radar conference and it's available in IEEE Explorer and also we have a, a review article on this topic. So uh, to think about to say like a passive radar uh, for uh, synthetic aperture radar, uh, so in for this example we consider we have three uh, transmitters and then the receiver will fly over, over uh, for a short uh, angle so in this case, in the so-called wave number domain, we can achieve three pieces because we have, have, we have three uh, biostatic pairs, uh, each corresponding to the, uh, these transmitters. And also this uh, region will be decided by the angle you fly the over and also the signal bandwidth. So in either way, we can see that the observed wave number region uh, observation actually is sparse and uh, random. So if you use the conventional Fourier-based techniques, uh, for example, back projection, actually that's the standard way to perform SAR imaging, that does not provide high quality SAR imaging because again of the narrow band uh, signal bandwidth and because of the random uh, sampling uh, pattern or say these positions, right? So, um, so basically the idea is, you know, if you have a dense observation in the wave number domain, by doing the free transform, you get a good SAR image. Whereas in our case, because we only have these three pieces here, so if you do the free transform, you would get a really poor uh, resolution and also high side lobes. So what we try to do is to utilize the sparsity in the scene, and then we can use the sparsity and the group sparsity based uh, uh, method to uh, reconstruct the image. So we can just uh, uh, show one example here. We use the three DVB uh, digital uh, video broadcast signals and the three uh, transmitters here. And we have a receiver here that flies uh, for a five, five degree uh, sector. And uh, so because of the low resolution and the bandwidth of the signal is 7.8 megahertz. So we see that, so, you know, if we use the back projection, the resolution is really poor, whereas by using the, uh, uh, compress sensing, we can get a very uh, high accurate, uh, high resolution uh, images. Uh, we also use the pass radar to perform target tracking by using Doppler only uh, observations because uh, you know of the narrow band uh, feature. Uh, it's much more com convenient to use the Doppler observation and also Doppler observation. Uh, in this case, actually, we are using multiple receivers. So Doppler observation does not uh, require us to update very really quickly and the information is really low. So we can achieve information fusion with a really uh, low data traffic and by using uh, compress sensing and also followed by the multi-tagged uh, uh, tracker, uh, we can achieve a, a really good uh, estimation performance. And then we also use the pass rate to perform space-time adaptive processing, but I'm going to skip this part. Okay, to, so to summarize the passive radar part, uh, passive radar provides a green solution for radar sensing because it does not emit signals and also it can be implemented with a low cost. So it's really a 
attractive in many applications, particularly when you do not have the spectrum and uh, it's also it's a convert, uh, convert and also it's difficult to jam because uh, it can be difficult to be identified. And also it, it will be much easier to uh, have a dense uh, deployment, uh, particularly say like for example, for drone detection. And at this moment, I think we see more interest from the defense and homeland security sectors. And also uh, concerns that remain regarding the performance and also the oper operational guarantee, because uh, again, the, uh, the read does not have the control of the sources. So to conclude my talk, we consider three parts, again, joint uh, radar communications and the radar communication coexistence and the passive radar. So for the future direction, I think sensing and the communication functions uh, will be more closely integrated. And for example, uh, we can consider multi-function radar. Um, for, for example, we can have a UAV networks for both of our functions and also automated radar and uh, uh, V2X. And uh, definitely, you know, we are more focusing on the array processing. So we, we uh, but we can see that array processing is exploiting convex and the mixed integer optimizations, fast based processing, information theoretical learning and machine learning would play critical roles. Um, that's, uh, yeah, um, for my presentation. So I would like to the members, uh, team members contribute to this talk. And also thank you very much. So I listed my uh, personal website and also my lab's uh, website here. So if you have uh, any, uh, welcome to yeah contact me. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Zhang. So um, very wonderful talk and we have received a number of questions. And so, so since you have talked about the neural networks, I have a, uh, Question uh, from Stefan. So Stefan, can you ask uh, Professor John by yourself? Yeah, sure. I hope the audio is better now. So my question is, um, you, you talked about using neural networks for- Sorry, Stefan, we cannot hear you very clearly. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm moving closer to the microphone now. I have no idea what the issue is. Maybe otherwise, if, I hope, is it better now? Sorry, Stefan. I think we not lost your own voice. <laughs> um, okay, maybe I can repeat uh, his question. So he's asking, can you elaborate on how neural networks can be used for more robust DOA estimation? How are those networks trained? Is this problem modeled as a classification or regression task? Okay, thank really you. good. Yeah, question. Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, I believe like uh, and, uh, at this moment, uh, most of the yeah work uh, on machine learning based uh, uh, DOA estimation is based on kind of simulated data. I think uh, to train uh, the neural network. So the idea is you can you know although you, you don't have the the real data, but you can you know consider all different kind of situations and uh, yeah to train the a neural network. Uh, so really, I think it depends on, you know, it all depends on how you can well understand the real uh, operation environment and how can you generate the, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the data to train the neural network. I don't know whether that answers your question or your concerns. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. And because I've okay. ambiguous, right? It's very hard to train a neural network. Right? So I think what we have to go for here is like a model-based approach where we um, use simulated data and then see how mm -hmm. we improve the performance of that. Yes. So actually similar questions, I believe, like, you know, yeah, um, have been discussed and I also personally actually, you know, yeah, uh, listened to a few similar discussions. I mean, this is always, I believe it's not like a solve the problem, but uh, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, I think that as time goes on, probably we have a yeah, better solutions. But at this moment, I would say, uh, you know, a very standard <laughs> answer is, yeah, we're trying to basically, as much as possible, we generate data that's, uh, that will reflect the real yeah, operation environments. Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. So we have another question from Hui Ping Huang. Hui Ping Huang regarding the uh, robust beam forming. So uh, Hui Ping, can you uh, ask uh, Professor Zhang by yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so first of all, thanks, Professor Zhang, for this interesting talk. And yeah, I have a, a, a detailed question regarding the uh, reconstruction of the interference plus noise uh, covalent matrix, which you introduced in slide number 19. So uh, to re reconstruct this covalence matrix, we need to uh, estimate the, the power of the interference, the DOAs of the interference, and as well as we need to know the, the noise power, right? Yeah. And as yeah, and as I know, we can uh, use the, the smallest uh, eigenvalue of the sample uh, covalent matrix as the uh, the noise power, as the estimate of the noise power. Uh, however, this, yes, however, this uh, estimate may not uh, accurate enough when the SNR is low or when mm -hmm. the number of snapshots is limited. So my mm -hmm. question is, uh, how can we get a better estimate of the noise power in such case? Uh, yeah, actually there are quite some uh, works in this direction. Actually, I think a better solution actually is to uh, use uh, comprehensing actually to estimate uh, or say sparsity based uh, process and to estimate the power of the design signal and also the power of the the, the noise power actually yeah uh, we also have uh, uh, some papers uh, talking about this so you yeah I think uh, uh, it, it because you know the yeah, sparsity based the processing you can put uh, this uh, uh, I think we can probably look at uh, no um, Um, yeah, just this kind of formula because it's minimizing the 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 uh, the error uh, between the observed data and also all the parameters here. So this one, this B in this case actually includes signal power and also the noise power. So it's it's a parameter to be estimated, just not like in the subspace basement. Yeah, you just average the uh, minimum eigenvalues. So again, yeah, sparsity based data estimation should give you better solutions. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Hui Ping. So um, uh, another question is from uh, Aishak. So uh, he's asking about the co-prime linear read. So Aishak, can you uh, ask the question by yourself? Yes, am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes. So please, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes. My question is in co-prime linear array, so we will end. Still, the problem of uh, ambiguity is persist, though it resolves the uh, the unambiguous estimates. But still, for few set of angles, uh, it encounter a problem of manifold ambiguity. So, I my question is, what is your comment on research towards resolving manifold ambiguity in co-prime linear array and other sparse array? Uh, I'm not sure, actually, can you clarify what do you mean by uh, ambiguity in the manifold? Uh, say, for example, uh, in co-prime linear arrays, yes. um, for a few set of angles, what happens is our directional matrix becomes uh, not a full rank in the sense uh, it uh, violates the full rank conditions. In that case, so we will get some unambiguous estimates of DOAs, so which has to be resolved. In, uh -huh. in general co-prime linear array, we will do the subarray sub based processings. So we will collect the data from one subarray and we will collect the data from second subarray and we yeah. will uh, find the DOA estimation and wherever it gets matched. So that is what our actual DOA is. No, I think that's actually not the way. I think yeah, this uh, this concept was presented in yeah yeah in P and PP's original paper, but that's not really the way uh, they or us uh, are doing uh, DOA estimation. Actually, by pairing you know the the DOAs using different subarrays. Actually, you know in general we put these sub two arrays together. 
So if you look yes. at the peer work on, you know, using music based processing or different, there are a lot of follow on works or, you know, the, the uh, sparsity based processing, you know, so this is not the way actually we put these sub -areas, uh, two sub -areas together and so there is no ambiguity in the in the manifold actually and the and also the match is different is uh, is uh, is uh, is a full rank uh, yes sir uh, but uh, in this configuration also recently in uh, recently a paper proposed and in this unfolded co linear configuration also we will encounter the manifold ambiguity for few set of angles uh, still uh, that the directional matrix is not hitting full rank. So it is rank deficient for a few set of angles. Okay. So, uh, because that might be the uh, one reason that because the inter element spacing here are greater than lambda by two, which means uh, we are uh, uh, not following that uh, spatial uh, sampling process here in the sense not less than lambda by two. Maybe that might be the one reason for maybe for some set of angles, this may not met. I mean, the idea is this, right? If you think about, you know, from the comprehensive perspective, okay? So uh, if you have, uh, uh, so say for comprehensive, right? You can sample signals randomly, okay? The idea is you cannot have a, like a, a equal spacing decimation, okay? So for example, you cannot have like an equal spacing array in this case, right? If you yes. have a, a array designed to say like with, you know, one wavelength like a plot, okay, then you would have an Whereas if you have a random placement of the sensors, okay, then you, okay. you will not have a, 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 this kind of ambiguity, right? So you can reconstruct signals. So say in comprehensive, you have to sample signals randomly, and the, so in the array case, it's the same, right? So the antenna can not, cannot be placed uniformly, but sparsely, okay? Then you cannot reconstruct. If you sample, the, if you place them sparsely, but not uniformly, then there will not be ambiguity, okay? There could be high side lobes, but you cannot say there are ambiguities, okay? Because uh, what's a grating problem? Because if you have a grating problem, apparently this problem cannot be solved. But the array is, is designed to not have this kind of problem. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think we have a final question from uh, Long, Long Wei Tian. So he's uh, asking about, uh, again, I think uh, robust beam forming. So Long Wei, please, can you ask by yourself? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, um, I would like to ask two simple questions. And my question is uh, mainly about the assumption of signal correlation. And mm -hmm. my first question are on the page 18. Mm -hmm. the, uh, does the equation on page 18 have the underlying assumption that the signals are uncorrelated or we can e say equivalently the, co the, the coherent components yes, sir, in the covariance yes. metric is omitted? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think uh, probably you're referring to different slides. Uh, yes, this uh, on, on this slide. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my, my question is that uh, uh, does this equation here have the, has the underlying assumption that the signals are uncorrelated? So you mean... Model? you want to talk about the signal correlation between design signal and interference, right? Uh, yes, yes. Mm, I cannot say differently, but I believe this one works because this one's canceling the, uh, you know, once you estimate them, right? This one trying to cancel the signal from the interference plus no, uh, basically canceling the signal from the interference elections. So yeah, this one should work. The problem oh. probably will be how do you estimate the, you know, this uh, uh, signal elections and the stream vector uh, in the presence of a uh, uh, of a correlated signals, right? So that's the problem of the DU estimation and the power estimation. But I think once you, once you reconstruct this coherence matrix, I think you should be fine. Okay, and my, my question is focused on 
um, because they are k components in this equation. Yeah, and uh, I my my question is that the uh, does there has the possibility that such k signals they will they would they may have the uh, coherent component here, and uh, in in that condition, this this matrix, this covariance matrix may have uh, an extra component here. Um, I think what you're talking about is if you calculate the coherence matrix between coherent or correlated signals, they would have more terms. So, but this is a different approach, right? This one basically says, you know, I estimate the DOA and the power of each components, and then I reconstruct this way. So basically it will, you know, yeah, mitigate the directions, uh, mitigate the components in these directions. Uh, so I think these are kind of like a different, uh, either say approach or a different formulation, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, and uh, my, my second question is uh, on the page 23. 20, and uh, yeah, 23. Yeah. And uh, here the, they have the same, uh, here has uh, assumption that the signals are uncorrelated here. And my question is that if the assumption here is changed to signals, they have correlated a correlation well, mm -hmm. it affects the subsequent uh, DOA detection method or the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah, really good question. So actually sparsity-based DOA estimation, uh, to my knowledge, actually mainly consider or say, assume the signals are uncorrelated. And there are some work also considering uh, the case with coherent signal, but uh, I think there are very really few um, papers or publications talking about cases with partially correlated cases. I think that's really challenging and this kind of model actually does not apply. So okay. this is still kind of like an open problem. Okay, S thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Zhang. I think uh, that will be all for, for today's talk. And uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation to give this very wonderful talk. Okay, thank you again for invitation and also for everyone to attend. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I, we hope to uh, see you in your uh, uh, future events. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, uh, that'll be all for today. And uh, we, we will announce our next event in uh, which will be happening uh, in January because we will uh, rest for uh, the December for the Christmas, so our next uh, webinar series will be at January. So I will, we will announce the details very soon and stay tuned. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you for listening and goodbye.